Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 622. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. Today's October 6th, 2020. All right, welcome to the show. You are faithful viewers because you're watching us again and again and again for 622 episodes. That's amazing. You guys have more patience than I do. I wouldn't have watched us that much. How about you, George? Probably not. No, no I, I like hearing the sound of my voice. That's, That's why right. I'm a minister. <laughs> so people have been, where are you now, Kevin? Where are you now? We are at Myrtle Beach. Well, you're looking out, you see trees in the background. The beach is about a block that way. We're actually in the middle Myrtle Beach State Park, which is a, uh, a forest, really, with high canopy trees that block out the internet. So we're having a little trouble here with cell signals. If George pixelates, it's because, um, well, there's trees, not beach, at Myrtle Beach. We're also, I don't, you haven't heard it yet, but you're going to hear jets flying by. We are in the landing uh, path of the airport, which is just about uh, a mile that way, the Myrtle Beach I bet it's an international airport. That's the, the goal of every airport. Uh, George, what have you been doing this week? We're reopening plans. We reopen for public worship on the 18th of October, Sunday. We've had our surveys. We've done our studies, and we've got a, we've got a schedule for you folks. We'll have three pre-recorded services: morning prayer, one communion with contemporary music, and a compline plus four live services, 7.45, 9, 10, 30, and 5 p.m. on Sundays. Wow. So seven shows, uh, uh, seven shows, continuous. We'll have popcorn in the auditorium <laughs> and in the in the uh, vestibule. And Now, it's, it's a lot of work. We have to do so many shows, both to accommodate those who can't come because of health and other concerns, and we have to basically divide up the congregation because they all can't come at the same time due to social distancing uh, guidelines. So we are spreading it out over the day. Well, a lot has happened since we last recorded. Uh, we recorded last week. Since then, uh, it had been announced that President Trump is COVID positive and he was uh, admitted to the hospital. He's since been released. And, you know, that kind of, in terms of the world, seems like almost a century ago. There's so much happening so quickly in the news cycles now that it's very difficult to keep up with. And it's the same with Anglican News, George. I know. I had two stories that were all set to go this week. The one about the elephant stampede in Bulawayo that went through a church during an evening prayer service, killing one woman. She was trampled to death by wild elephants. And the other, the story from Akiti in Nigeria, where a, uh, three men were captured digging up corpses in the Anglican church graveyard. Uh, for voodoo ceremonies and purposes. So we were going to have a zombie apocalypse in Nigeria. And they got sort of pushed to one side. They did. Um, we'll talk about, uh, obviously, Bishop Love is going to be the big story. But breaking today was another big story out of the Church of England. They re finally released their institutional report on for the child sex victims and uh, how they were not able to get any help from the church before or after uh, the victimization. And I thought uh, we could open with that because that's what we do, George. Well, let me give you a bit of background for people. You'll hear the phrase ICSA, which is the short for Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse. In 2014, the British government set up an independent inquiry into institutional responses to sexual abuse. We've had parallel royal commissions in, in Australia uh, and I believe New Zealand that have yeah, and New Zealand that have looked at this issue that have looked at churches that at schools and One of the people looked at in depth was the churches in England and Wales and the report on those two churches was released this morning and It's not pretty The I, I skimmed through it. It's about a 70 page report. It had a few case studies but the conclusions were devastating the conclusions were that the Church of England basically put protection of reputation above the care for those victimized. It put uh, the old boy network above uh, 
getting to the bottom of matters. At the, in other words, all the things that people have been said about the Church of England, that it was tribal, that they were incredibly naive, that they were at the beck and call of their lawyers, all was demonstrated in this report. I give you an example uh, from the report, one of the case studies, a man who was uh, AN4 or 5, I think AN is anonymous or somebody, uh, reported being abused as a boy to the Church of Safeguarding Officers, and this was patched up to Bishop Paul Butler, who was the chief safeguarding officer at the time, Bishop of Durham. And he began to do pastoral support and care for this man as it was investigated. Meanwhile, the man regained, retained legal counsel to sue the church for damages. The church's lawyers and the ecclesiastical insurance company say, Bishop Butler, you may no longer speak to this man. We can only speak to him through his lawyer. So the church's response to the pastoral needs of his victims was, you have my lawyer, talk to your lawyer. Which is so wrongheaded and, it, well, well, I think we we have many lawyers that watch the program, and they would say, no, no, uh, just because of past experience, we know that sometimes you just don't want to handle it that way. Uh, when a lawyer, when lawyers get involved, um, things get worse. True, but at the same time, if the victim, I think, would have been foolish not to have engaged counsel, because oh, sure. otherwise nothing would have ever happened because mm -hmm. the case would have just been filed away or as we like to say there was a flood and the base and the files in york cathedral york, the archbishop of york's basement were flooded out oops sorry lost the file well there, the, well, that, there was well there was a mini freak out last week or uh, two weeks ago when you reported that uh incidents of sexual abuse and child sexual abuse happened just as much in protestant churches as the roman catholic church and this report kind of clarifies that and says yeah that's that's what we're finding and we saw the same in the new zealand report and the australia report that being roman catholic doesn't make you a special pedophile uh, it happens in all uh, denominations yeah and well the difference is is that the rate of offending among clergy is roughly the same mm -hmm. however in the catholic system with parochial schools one offender may abuse 100, 150 sure. boys over the course of a ministry, while a parish priest who's an offender may abuse in the Anglican system four or five over his ministry because he doesn't have access to the victims. If you're running a parochial school with your parish, you're a fox in the hen house. Right. So the report, the scientific studies, so the, the studies coming out, at, I can speak only of the United States, the studies that I've read, that the rate of offending among clergy, rabbis, school teachers, scoutmasters, is roughly the same across groups. Um, it's just that some groups have higher access, have more access to, to people. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a recent little article we ran on Anglican Inc. Uh, that sort of illustrates all the faults of the English system. There was a priest who last week was sentenced to eight years in prison for molesting two little girls, one nine and one twelve, pre-pubescent children. So that would make him a pedophile. Mm -hmm. uh, not a teenage girl, which would be an ebiophile or whatever, but a pedophile, someone who had not had, you know, entered puberty. Man was a former military chaplain, 24 years. Uh, a good chap, one of the one of the guys, part of the right tribe within the Church of England, part of the right social class in the Church of England. Uh, he was an emeritus canon of Carlisle Cathedral. He was socially acceptable. He pled guilty, and before the sentencing, he asked the Bishop of Carlisle, James Newsom, to write him a recommendation at the sentencing hearing. And Newsom, after the man had pled guilty to being a pedophile, gave a character reference for the judge in determining the sentence. The judge noted this. It only came out because the judge noted this in open court that he was surprised that a bishop would give a character reference to a pedophile priest. 
And now Newsom is saying, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Oh, I was foolish in thinking that. I knew him for 18 years and he was a good chap. I couldn't possibly see him fiddling with little girls. Here's, here's, here, what's at work here? The tribe. Newsom and the uh, pedophile man named Robert Bailey were the same class, the same background, the same good sort who knew each other. The naivete, oh, I couldn't imagine this great chap we played squash together on weekends could uh, meddle with little girls. The old boy network, well, I'll see if I can get the judge to knock a few years off his sentence in a private letter to the court. Any concern for the victims? Any concern for justice? Any concern? And, and also, the ju bishop was concerned about the reputation of the Church of England. Uh, let's see what we can do to sort of, sh 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 you know, we want to make clear that this man was fiddling with little girls who were the children of friends. They weren't parishioners, so that was an important point to make. No, not really. Uh, hmm. it, it just, the, the Newsom case, and Newsom will be reviewed by a, a committee in the House of Bishops, and they'll say, silly man, don't do this again. And we'll get a statement saying, lessons will be learned, mistakes were made, but in the future, we'll yeah. do exactly the same thing again, <laughs> so long as we don't get caught. We'll, we'll, do what a, we'll do what a lawyer's <laughs> tell us to do, yes. We'll learn to do it better. Yeah. So that the, I'm not picking on Bishop Nukes, uh, because the instant the system in which he works brought about this outcome he did what the system in other words a train does decide where it goes you lay down the tracks and that's where the train goes the search of england has these tracks laid down that protect their own that uh put you know the reputation above all and those who work in the system just roll down these tracks, whether they're nice guys or bad guys, it, it gets to the same end, um, just at different speeds. Yeah, it, it's hundreds of years of a system, and it's going to be very difficult to change the, the system within the Church of England, which is a great transition, George, to another system that is a... Uh, uh, broken and it has laid its brand new tracks recently uh for hundreds of years the episcopal church was a uh a church that supported marriage between a man and a woman recent innovations have changed that to where now they have decided in the last two two and a half three conventions that they will now as a pastoral gift grace uh, allow for same-sex blessings uh, to be conducted or same-sex marriages actually and we have a couple three or four bishops conservative bishops left in the episcopal church one of them was brought up on charges for not allowing same-sex marriages within his diocese and now he has been formally charged and found guilty and i thought well we got to talk about that because why haven't the other three been found guilty? What are the processes in the system within the church uh, that has changed so rightly? And um, where does Bishop Love go from here? So Bishop Love, let's give a little background. Before Anglican TV, uh, I ran a blog called ct6.org. And one of the first, uh, the first, consecration I ever filmed and live streamed with Bishop Loves in Albany and that was many eons ago so I just want to give you an update I'm on his side <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of Bishop Love uh, but I always saw over the last uh, dozen years a, a little bit of discord between the diocese and what they wanted and kind of the leadership the standing committee within the Diocese of Albany some wanted to join the ACNA and just get this over with, we're leaving now. Some said, let's try and fix the system. Some said, let's keep our heads down and nobody will know nothing. We'll just operate here as a diocese. And like other dioceses have successfully, when the presiding bishop shows up, we'll give them a quick tour, we'll uh, do our curtsies, and we'll send them on their way. Uh, over time, that struggle has found itself where we are now where 
uh, Bishop Love has been found guilty by a uh, the leadership of the Episcopal Church for not doing the innovations that they want done. Uh, George, what are your thoughts on this? Well, there are about 50 different topics here. Yeah. And we have to be careful because I think an injustice was done by Bishop Love. I've, I've read not the by, uh, arguments. Two, two, yeah, two bishops. You're correct. <laughs> and an, it, an injustice was done to Bishop Love. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alan Haley uh, wrote a very gr- fantastic legal analysis of the case, which I can't top. It, it basically said the Episcopal Church has no leg to stand on legally. Mm-hmm. And that may be very true, and I'm convinced of that. But part of the mistake was assuming this was a legal proceeding. Correct. Um, again, it's Bishop Love did what Bishop Love believed he needed to do to stand firm for what he believed. Other bishops do what they need to do to stand firm for what they believe, but they take different routes. And we need to remember there's a very strong difference in regions around here, uh, regional Episcopalianism, if you will. So l- what am I talking about? Um, first off, uh, in Albany, you have some di- p- parishes that have consistently been at odds, Dan Herzog and now sure. Bill Love, and they're professional gripers and complainers. So you had a group of malcontents who were out to get Bishop Love from the very beginning. Bishop Love responded not by the time on or process of waffling, but by saying no. Uh, see, in, in Central Florida, we have we have the same exact policy as Bishop Love does, but there's no presentments against Bishop Brewer. There's no grief because we only have the one parish that wants to do it. And Bishop Brewer said, okay, these are the steps that you need to take. And this is how we go forward. And uh, it's, it's like the, it's like the, it's like getting your driver's license. Uh, you, you go in, oh, well, I'm sorry. We now need two forms of identification. Come back in eight weeks and stand in line for six hours. And well, I think your point is, is well taken both Dallas and central Florida and others institute the policy of molasses you want they, to do what well all right what here's what you need to do and when you give, meet these criteria they give they give lip service mm-hmm. to the sense of not standing up and saying no we won't do this but rather saying we don't want to do this but we're compelled to but these are the steps you they put the onus on those who want change mm-hmm. and See, the northern, like, for instance, the Diocese of Montreal was one of the first in Canada to introduce same-sex marriages, and it was a big project, big to do. Then they instituted it, and three or four marriages were formed, and they were almost all among clergy. And guess what happened? No. No more gay marriages. Why? Because nobody wanted to get married who was gay in the church. The, you know, the secular culture of Canada saw no point in getting a church marriage for a cohabiting gay couple. They could get a civil marriage. Why would they want to go to this church anyway? Albany's culture, the most, uh, I, I believe the Schenectady, uh, I think is one of the most, uh, I saw a study that Schenectady was one of the most uh, secular cities in the eastern part of the United States. Schenect- good old Schenectady. I, I, I mean, in no the, idea. <laughs> diocese, of, diocese of Albany. Uh, so Albany does has a small group of people like Montreal. It's the same situation. Small group. This is an issue. We must get this done. And once it happens, there's not going to be a constant flow. Otherwise, move down to Central Florida. We have we form a lot. Uh, we form more marriages. Uh, and we have large gay communities and pockets here, but the pressure is not on the church to do this. So you've got local politics involved. And, but really when we talk about the system, and again, Bishop Love stood, fought the good fight, did what he needed to do, but he was in a system and in a place where he, 
And he, his lawyers responded as if this were a legal trial when it was a political trial. Why can I say that? Well, the judge, Nick Nisley, Bishop of Rhode Island, the head of the tribunal, is a decent man, decent man, kind man, intelligent man. I believe he has a PhD in physics. He's not the old generation of crazy Jack Spong types, or uh, well, he is a he's a mo he's a modern progressive who wants the good for everybody. But is it he, he is also he... was the sponsor yeah. of the resolution that Love was accused of violating? He's one of the co-sponsors. He's mm. one of the authors. That makes At him the, the general... victim. Right? He's, he's the victim, okay. if you will. At the general convention. This was the middle ground. This was the compromise that nicely helped broker between the liberals who basically wanted no prisoners, we're going to force it on everybody, we're going to slit your throats unless you do it. This was the middle road compromise that nicely fought to protect people like Brewer and uh, Love and the Bishop of Dallas and the Bishop of Tennessee and so on and so forth. This was the middle ground. And so for Nisley, it's like, oh, God, this guy, how stupid can he be? I just saved him, and now he's forcing me. Uh, so in other words, Nisley was put in the position of being both his own, being the victim and the judge of the process. And so you cannot say, you, I don't think it's fair to say that Nisley acted with any malice or bad intentions or bad thoughts, but he's coming from a position. See, when the Episcopal Church was founded, they set up the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops, and they were going to set up an, an independent judiciary. They never got around to it. So one of the problems of the Episcopal Church from the very beginning was its legal disciplinary canons. Up until the 1970s or 80s, each diocese was absolutely autonomous in that sense. Then we started with Browning, and then it reached its climax with Catherine Jefford Shorey saying dioceses are subsidiaries of the Episcopal Church without any independent means. Those cases went to lawsuits in, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, and in some states like Illinois and Texas and in South Carolina, the diocese can leave. Mm -hmm. States like California, New York, Pennsylvania, the diocese can't leave. We've got different laws on this. But there was never a judiciary set up of independent people. It was always a political system. And when it was within the diocese, that was fine because the bishop got what he wanted. Uh, but now it's been moved up a notch and it's now become a popularity contest. So that when you have this trial, uh, because Bishop Love wouldn't go along to get along, I expect the outcome, which was unanimous, by the way, there mm -hmm. wasn't any dissent in this ruling. Now, I've not gone through the ruling with a fine tooth comb, and there is an appeal process, and the sentence will probably be light, but the damage has been done. This was the reason that John Howe, the Bishop of Central Florida, gave for withdrawing from the Episcopal Church to, to be received by the ACNA, that the authority of bishops was being destroyed in the mad long, headlong rush to celebrate a minority view on human sexuality. So it's easy to point fingers and say shame and Ichabod and all this and that, but there's a bit of a lack of understanding of the deeper issues going on here, in my opinion. Well, I, I think it, it the system is extremely political. We've seen that uh, repeated itself uh, in gener in, in for a whole generation, at least, within the Episcopal Church. For my, myself, I'm outside the Episcopal Church. When I see a bishop martyred, you know, in in this way for for you know, maybe not good versus evil, maybe political. I'm like, well, this is the Episcopal Church. What were you What were you expecting? They have taken their train tracks and laid them in a different direction now recently and they're going to stick with those train tracks and bishop loves aren't going to survive the new destination of the episcopal church i don't know if a lot of 
future bishops who want to be on that same destination the Episcopal Church is on, or if they want to try and struggle and put the tracks back to where they were before. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. I think it's very hard to work within the system of the Episcopal Church. I pray for the day that the ACNA and the Episcopal Church can be reunited uh, through repentance and, um, you know, re-examine a wonderful relationship a generation from now. We'll have to see what happens. Uh, it, it's one of those things. Uh, I kind of, it was my guess that this was going to happen. When, when Love was brought up in charges, I said, they're, they're going to get him. Uh, this issue is too important to the Episcopal Church or to the, those in the leadership of the Episcopal Church. Yeah, I think it was a foregone conclusion. You know, we discussed it, you know. Well, I I have a long history, if you were knowledge, of Episcopal Church cases. You do? The first one I got involved with, uh, not as a defendant. Uh, <laughs> what, writer? <laughs> but as a, uh, I've, I was an expert witness in half a dozen legal cases and I also, my first involvement was with the case of Cy Jones. Jones was a bishop of Montana. Which one was that? And Cy Jones uh, well, basically uh, was an adulterer. He had some affairs with women while he was married. And he confessed his affairs in a formal confession to Ed Browning, the presiding bishop. He was brought up on charges of sexual morality and abuse and this, that, and Browning testified to what Jones confided to Browning. Now, what was driving the whole prosecution, in other words, in the past, such things would have been resolved by Jones basically quietly retiring early. Uh, you know, he would basically be put out to pasture being in Montana was not far out, nothing pasture. They would put him somewhere even pasture. farther out. <laughs> but this was the rise of, if you will, the aggressive feminist uh, wing of the Episcopal Church, and Cy Jones was going to be a scout. Mm -hmm. And so the sanctity of the confessional was no, was violated in the Jones case to get Jones. Now, Jones was guilty. Yeah. Um, but the point was, the only way he could have been shown to be guilty was his confession, which was made this way. This, oh, this is the early 90s, 90s I think. 90s, 93, 90s. Early 90s. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, as a, very, as a young man, I knew these things were political. They were not... Uh, then we had the Walter Ryder trial where Walter Ryder's jurors were going to find him not guilty, his, his judges were going to find a way to find him not guilty. And we had a finding of Ryder did not violate the core doctrine of the Episcopal Church, just the peripheral doctrines of the Episcopal Church, which was a novel innovation that has never been repeated in any sort of finding. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Did not, Bishop Love did not violate the core doctrine of the Episcopal Church? No, because it's <laughs> because we've been told in the Ryder case that human sexuality was not a core doctrine. And so now we have the Love case where the case wasn't over human sexuality per se, even though that was the predica predicating issue. The mm -hmm. issue was the authority of general convention. And the argument was, can General Convention pass a resolution, which is not a constitutional amendment or canonical change? It did go through two turns of General Convention. It didn't have all of this or that. It was just a compromise put together to it, you know, make these things move forward. And that should not have been, as Alan Haley po points out with great legal acumen, mm -hmm. it's advisory. It has the same legal weight as, you know, I can remember when I was a young priest, one of the first things that I saw at a general convention that affected me was no smoking in the parish halls. What? Yeah, like I was really going to enforce that with little old ladies knitting with yes. a cigarette in their mouth. Yeah, I was really going to do that. And so what did I do? I just waited for all to die. <laughs> and then <laughs> gradually said, oh, well, I, I, I think because we have so many children now, let's yeah. just lay off. You know, uh, I didn't implement it immediately. Uh, 
I'm not a smoker myself. It wasn't something that was, nor was it a burning issue in my heart. Uh, but, or, you know, the Episcopal Church passes resolutions on free Mumia Abu Jamal and uh, let's end the embargo of Cuba and uh, all this nonsense. Cody 2012. I, <laughs> you know, do animals do animals go to heaven or not? I mean, I actually enjoyed that because I'm interested in that topic, sure. but 90 percent of what general convention does is absolute utter rubbish and nobody pays any attention to the hundreds of resolutions over these years save for the ones that are political hot 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 political issues mm -hmm. so what happens now well he appeals uh he may persuade an appellate tribunal that the judgment was not founded in the law because the facts are not in dispute then he if then we'll have some sort of sentence and the sentence will probably be an admonishment this doesn't rise to the level of uh deposition but they but they're just going to kick this can down the road uh, it's like some of the property cases. You've got the first case here, and then you go to the appellate case, then you go to the Supreme Court, and then it goes back down to the appellate case, which sends it back to the lower case for facts finding it. You know, the, the, the Episcopal Church is well rehearsed in this game. Well, we talked about the politics of molasses before, where some of the conservative dioceses are doing it. 815 is the master of all molasses politics. You know, they mm -hmm. can lose stuff. Uh, sent to them in, in a heartbeat and find it generations later. Ah, well, well, yes. well, for instance, General Convention has said we're moving our headquarters out of New York City. It's too expensive. We, you know, we have to pay huge salaries for people mm -hmm. living in New York City. We've got this huge building across from the UN that you know is worth a fortune that we're renting out half of it. Move to Louisville. Move to St. Louis, where there's cheap office space, where it's cheap cost of living. Um, people in California complain that by the time they get up, the people have gone home for the day in New York. Uh, they leave at two o'clock. That has passed general convention, but executive council has thought of all these reasons not to implement it yeah. that are not legal or canonical. And it's the same violations that love is accused of, but you know, the head of the, uh, the, the members of the executive council aren't brought up on charges. Again, it's political. It's the powers that be wanting to do something. Now, in the Love case, this was driven by malcontents in his diocese. Uh, basically, uh, unpleasant people uh, who wanted to force the issue. And you're always going to have cranks out there. Uh, fortunately, there are a lot of them in the Episcopal Church. Yes, uh, clergy. <laughs> clergy. Cranks. <laughs> Bishops. <laughs> Laity. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, but it's not as bad as it used to be. I can remember we had one, uh, one fame, well, for me, infamous case where Matt Kennedy, a well, friend of this show, a priest in the ACNA, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a Cana, it's not Cana anymore. No, it's but, not Cana. Uh, he's, I forget what diocese he's in, but he's not Cana. Uh, they've got a new name now. His yeah. wife is a priest as well. Yeah. And an Episcopal priest in Newark, Diocese of Newark, on on social media, wished her dead. Wished her dead. Mm -hmm. And she really meant it. Elizabeth Caton. Uh, yeah. There's a generation of wickedness. And but now I... it's turned into a generation of institutional you know, conformity. Well, I think there is still that generation that wants to wipe out the, the patriarchy, wants to wipe out the old church, the 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 white church, so to speak. I think that there's still that uh, energy of wickedness within um, modern day feminism, uh, modern day Marxism, uh, modern day uh, liberalism, that uh, you know has nothing to do with the church. You, you see how the church gets no support in any levels of leadership in California. You know, you're closed until we say you can open. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can You can get on the uh, Boeing 777, seat to seat to seat, row to row to row, if you wear a mask, but you can't do the same in a church until we say you can. Um, and that's but, just 
But what we're seeing, Kevin, and yeah. if, I, if I may take Go your ahead. analogy, sure. yeah. people vote with their feet. Um, we've seen people, San Francisco has been having a population loss. It's just been announced that Boeing is moving production uh, that may amount to almost 70,000 jobs from the Seattle area to okay. South Carolina. Yeah. Um, people are voting with their feet, leaving the Episcopal Church in parts of the country and going to other denominations, including the ACNA, we're leaving entirely and just waiting for this to blow over. It's not a universal phenomenon. We're not seeing that, at least in my neck of the woods, we're not seeing any decline. We're seeing growth um, because the white patriarchal church that people may want to destroy in California or Washington, yeah, we're doing just fine here, thank you very much. And there's not much you can do to destroy me here. Yeah, indeed well that was our long what is that uh i'm gonna show my age 35 minute report <laughs> uh, kevin can't can't we talk about the zombie apocalypse in nigeria or the it would be so much team? easier i mean um it, it's a rough week you and i come on the program and we have to talk about the tough tough issues we talk about where the church is failing hopefully that the church will recognize where it's failing and correct itself. Um, that's not the you know the greatest desire I have every week to sit down for an hour, talk to George. We do a pre-show. What do you want to talk about now? And we, you know, had hoped we could talk about the zombie stuff. But, you know, other bigger things breaking uh, with the love news yesterday and the uh, the Church of England news today. That's rough, but you got to talk about it because nobody else will. Nobody else is willing to sit down and talk about these hard things. I'm going to give myself a bit of a plug. Uh, oh. On Sunday, I preached a sermon about losing your religion, where I made the song? where I made fun of REM, <laughs> yeah, and actually said that's what Saint Paul wants you to do is to lose your religion right. and find Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And the Episcopal Church needs to lose its religion, meaning its institutional. The Church of England and the Episcopal Church need to lose their religions and find Christ. And when you do that, all of this stuff uh, is, shows how unimportant it is in relation to the true bigger picture, which is I, eternal life in Jesus Christ. Absolutely, for the last 10 years we've been watching, I've only been a journalist for 10 years in this. For the last 10 years, I've just been watching these slow train wreck, you know, where the, the trains were missed the line on the wrong tracks. Thank you for watching another Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 622 or 3. Yeah, that's about right. 22. We'll go 22. Low 620s of Anglican Unscripted.